in the name and spirit of the God who created us, the God who redeems us, and the God who blesses us. We are welcome to this time of ordination. God's Holy Spirit has led us all to this moment. Shirley has led James to declare himself a candidate for ordination, and for that, thanks be to God. We hear a scriptural call to worship. This truly is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So enter his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with highest praise. Please join me in prayer. This is the day long anticipated, O Lord. This is the moment for which we have longed. We are grateful to all who have had a hand in guiding James to this celebration of faith. After months of planning and preparation, we turn to you and seek the presence of your Holy Spirit. Let these be the moments when we listen carefully with open hearts and minds that your Holy Spirit will take all that has been planned and use it to your honor and glory. We do pray, O Lord, that in this moment of ordination, it will be such that to it all, you can give it your blessing. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We'll join in singing our first hymn, number 525, Join We All With One Accord. I invite us to stand. Please remain standing and join with me in our responsive prayer, which is found in the bulletin.
We praise you, O God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Your saving work shines through all the ages. We thank you for fulfilling your covenant through the eternal ministry of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. We thank you for the ministry committed by Christ to the whole church to proclaim the gospel. We thank you that you call individuals from among us to the ordained ministry of word and sacrament. They serve among us to lead, strengthen, challenge, and nourish our ministry together in Christ. And especially on this day, we thank you for your call to James and for his dedication to serve in your name. On behalf of the Church of Bay Ray Congregation, I'd like to welcome all of you and, and thank you for being here. This is a very, very special day for us. It is special for James. It is certainly a special time for his family and friends and for us as a congregation. And so we deeply appreciate your presence. We'd also like to invite you to join with us immediately following downstairs. We have uh, a wonderful dinner, and you should come down for no other reason than to see the cake. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, please, uh, as we uh, conclude our worship and the ordination this afternoon, we invite you to come downstairs and join us for a time of food and fellowship.
Our first scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, in which Jesus says to his disciples, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. And from Psalm 139, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. It was an early summer morning that I found myself at morning devotions. The place, what is called the living room, at Ring Lake Ranch, an ecumenical retreat in the state of Wyoming. As we sat silently, Brother Bill began reading. He began to read from a book by Henry Nowen, a Catholic priest. Now, never mind that Bill's voice was gravelly. Never mind that he had a post-nasal drip that caused him to sniff all the way through the reading. And never mind the scenery out that window, that large window, the mountainside, and the lake below where I wanted to be fishing. <laughs> but what he was reading had my attention. It had my attention then, and it has my attention now, to this day. It's one of the most treasured books in my library. The Living Reminder points out that his ministers all of us, all of us who declare Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all of us are reminders of Jesus Christ. And I think that is something of which we need to be reminded today, especially today. Not just the ordained, but all of us are living reminders of Jesus. And how much you and I do need reminders. Whether there's a note on the table or my three by five cards that I religiously keep to date. Or perhaps it is my calendar or the word Paul be sure to. I have this ring on my finger as a reminder of the vows we shared some 56 years ago. My passport is a reminder how essential it is to have it to get out of this country, but also, more importantly, to get back in. <laughs> I have to say it aside, when I go to Labrador and I return to Toronto, how good it is to see that American flag pointing the way back home. There's nothing quite like it. An invitation was sent out to announce and invite us to this opportunity to come and worship this afternoon. 
in this service of ordination, as James' family and friends, we have come. As members of this congregation and the wider Moravian Church, we have come. As members of the Freedom Moravian Church, where you will soon be installed, have come. As members of the ecumenical community, our cherished partners in ministry, we have come. And this is not just good. This is all very good. Very good indeed. But it is now one who takes us to the most insignificant reminders of all as we experience them in the sacraments and in the Holy Scriptures. It is baptism to which we turn for entrance into the faith community. And it is to the Eucharist that we turn to be sustained day by day, moment by moment, receiving the life of Christ anew into our whole beings. And it is in the scriptures that you and I find Jesus. And it is in Jesus that we discover the answers needed for our faith journey. And so today is a day to be reminded from scripture. First of all, from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 18. This is a, a text of my choosing. And we'll get to the one of your choosing in just a moment. <laughs> so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and given us the ministry of reconciliation. All around us, sadly, there is continual evidence of the need for a ministry of reconciliation. The brokenness, the division, the separated life, that is all too prevalent. We see the results in pain and anguish, discouragement and hopelessness and disillusion. Thankfully, in the midst of it all, we have the key. We have the key. In the midst of all the unpleasantness, we hold the gift. Unfortunately, it is a key and a gift that all too often is withheld. Unfortunately, it may be a gift that is forgotten or is just plain and simply too little used. And that gift is the ministry of reconciliation. Now, that's one of those big, long words, and I think it's important to ask, what does it look like? Our Lord Jesus himself modeled this ministry of reconciliation with the woman caught in adultery when he said, neither do I condemn you. John 8, 10. What does this reconciliation look like? Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Note there's no pause in there, there's no comma, there's no hesitation. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. They go hand in hand. What does it look like? Read in John 4, 7. Jesus crossed cultural and gender boundaries of his day asking the Samaritan woman for a drink from the well. And even though the disciples were astonished that he was speaking with this woman, Jesus didn't flinch and he didn't quit. He engaged her in significant conversation 
of deep spiritual importance. That's what reconciliation looks like. Forgetting the boundaries and the barriers, forgetting the things that tend to divide and separate us, to reach out the hand toward our sister or our brother, taking a step to bridge the gap between us, looking into the face of one who is also a child of God. We seek justice for the immigrant. We seek justice for those who are put down. We seek justice no matter what the status or standing is of that individual. For they truly are our sisters and our brothers. This is what reconciliation in part looks like. But then, on this day of ordination, we need to be reminded through the words of a text that you chose, James. John 15, 12 to 17. And I like the emphasis that reader put on it. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. My friends, this is not a request. This is not an if you happen to get around to it. This is not a, well, when the time is right, a command. Love one another, regardless and no matter what. Love one another with a Corinthian love. Love one another at all times, in all places, in all ways. On an ordination day when an individual has heard that call to specific ministry as an ordained servant, I think it is important for us to be reminded, just as Episcopal presiding Bishop Michael Curry reminded worshipers at the royal wedding some weeks ago. He said, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love, and when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world, for love is the only way. And when we do that, there's power in love. And don't underestimate it. Don't even over-sentimentalize it. And still quoting, imagine our homes and our families, our neighborhoods, and our communities where love is the way. Imagine governments and nations, image business and commerce where this love is the way. Imagine this old, tired world when love is the way. And when love is the way, then no child will go hungry in this world ever again. And when love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream and righteousness like an ever-flowing brook. When love is the way, we will lay down our swords and our shields down by the riverside to study war no more. When love is the way, there's plenty good room, plenty good room for all of God's children. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all, and we are brothers and sisters, children of God. My brothers and sisters, that's a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, a new human family. End quote. James, Thank you for choosing that passage. Chosen, I am sure, because it had special meaning for you and how you view life and ministry. I chose the text, Be Reconciled with One Another. And both of those gifts provide a powerful witness to the world that is so desperately needed today. 
How can any of us leave this service of ordination without making a recommitment to the Ministry of Reconciliation and probably need to start perhaps within our own families and most assuredly within our church families in our communities, wherever we find ourselves, without making a ministry of reconciliation a new commitment, without promising ourselves that we will love more fully, we will love more completely, and love way beyond our comfort zones. If God, by the Holy Spirit, should make this happen among us, what an affirmation this will be for you, James. And what a statement we will make, not just within these four walls, but in the world out there of which you and I are a part. Oh Lord, let us pray that it will be so. Amen. is before us. A special rite of the church that acknowledges an individual who has received the call of God through Christ to be a servant specifically in ordained ministry. It is good that you have chosen your representatives. Brother Matt and Tim Newton. Wonderful that our Provincial Elders Conference President can be with us to make this whole thing official. And we celebrate this moment with a renewed commitment to stand with you and with one another in this mutual ministry.
of the Moravian Church, the Provincial Elders Conference requests that you ordain James Joseph Hero, a deacon, by the authority given to you by Christ and the Church. We believe James has shown himself to be sound in doctrine and faith, and has demonstrated a sincere intention to serve Christ and the Church through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the presence of God in this congregation, I acknowledge this testimony and accept the commission which I have received from the Church through the Provincial Elders Conference. Brother James, do you wish to respond? Good. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, you get an idea that you think you know what everything feels like. You think you know uh, what today will be like. And as I walked out here, I had no idea uh, what I would be feeling. And I was completely surprised by that. And I'm thankful that Kim was sitting in front of me while the choir was singing their anthem because they would have been distracted by me in a ball of tears behind them singing. So I'm thankful that Kim was there to block their view. And I'm just really thankful for all of you to be here today to celebrate uh, this next step in my ministry and in my life for the support and care you've offered to get to this point and for your presence here especially for those who worked so hard in planning this to get this uh, sanctuary looking so beautiful and Fellowship Hall as well, and for people who traveled to get here too. Just under three years ago, we had a service here to help send me off to seminary, and in a way, I've been haunted by that service for those last three years. For my moment to speak, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank people and mention how they've made an impact on my life. As I was doing this, I planned to talk about my brother Joel and my sister-in-law Sarah after I spoke about my mom and grandma. Well, as you can imagine, as I spoke about mom and grandma, I got a little choked up. And I knew that if I tried talking about Joel and Sarah immediately after them, I would completely melt. I decided to talk about somebody else with the intention of getting back to them at the end. Eventually, I wrapped up my speech, and as I sat down, a wave of shock and shame came over me. I forgot to get back to Joel and Sarah. I was completely mortified, and it has stayed with me ever since. So Joel and Sarah, you're, I know you're away now. Whenever you watch this on YouTube, <laughs> I know you knew three years ago that I loved you, and I just wanted to be extra sure to tell you today that I love you as well. But well, that slip by me taught me something that has remained a theme throughout my seminary education and my experience in parish ministry, and that is to choose your words carefully. In school, I had a reputation in all of my classes to be one of, if not the quietest person in the classroom. I was rarely eager to jump in on classroom discussions and was much more comfortable and happy listening to other people's thoughts and beliefs. In a way, this gave me an advantage because when I finally did speak, people were sure to listen. <laughs> My classmates mentioned that they listened because they knew when I spoke, I had something worthwhile to say. Now, I'm not sure if that was always the truth or not, but I certainly appreciated being heard by them. It has led me to reflect more seriously on the words we share and the actions we make and how big of an impact they can have on the people around you. I chose our passage from John for this afternoon as my way of affirming the words and actions you have shared with me. Jesus simply tells his disciples to love each other and that they are no longer his servants, but his friends. And I wanted to thank you for following that command Jesus gives to his disciples today. As family, friends, mentors, and as church family members, You've shown me what it means to follow that instruction from Jesus. You have supported me. You have challenged me. You've trusted me with responsibility. And most importantly, you have shared Christ's love with me. Today is tangible proof of the impact that words and actions of others can have on someone's life. Thank you for carefully living out your faith. I also share that message as I look ahead. I share this knowing that 
We are living in delicate times when we consider the relationship between Christianity and our country and Christianity and the world. I know that our actions as Christians and our words are being monitored closely and have an impact on other people. The world right now is desperate for that sense of community. People are longing for patterns of division and disagreement to be overcome with expressions of friendship and love. What we say and what we do as our response to that love Christ has shown us is needed. And when we do speak and act, people pay attention. Today, I promise to choose my words and actions carefully as a leader within the Moravian Church. I also promise to do so boldly. I can say this confidently because I know I'm not entering this ministry alone. From pastors who will now be my colleagues, to the people who have shaped me to this point and will continue to shape me, to the people in the pews that I will serve with, I'm very excited about what lies ahead for the Moravian Church. I am humbled to use what God sees in me to serve with God's people. I'm committed to helping our church choose our words and actions carefully because I believe the world needs to see and hear more about us. Right now we have plenty of examples and throughout history as well, pretty, plenty of bad examples of what Christianity looks like. And sadly, many of those examples get a lot of the attention. I believe the world around us is looking for the exact message that we have to share that we are devoted to lives of love and service, and that all people deserve to experience that divine love that God gives us. It is my prayer that the relationship that we share and the relationships that will form will be loud tools to help God's love be seen and heard in the world. Thank you. And I now invite you to respond to these ordination bodies. James, you trust that you have been brought by divine grace to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is my humble trust. Do you believe in the truth of the Old and New Testament scriptures as inspired by the Holy Spirit? I do. Do you freely accept the obligations of an ordained minister to study, pray, care for souls, preach, and administer the sacraments in Christ's church. I freely accept them. Do you solemnly promise as you serve in the Moravian unity to give obedience to the faith and the order of the Moravian church as these are formulated under scripture and the Holy Spirit by our synods and constituted authorities. I solemnly promise obedience to them. Sisters and brothers, as members of the body of Christ, will you affirm, uphold, and encourage James in this ministry? Yeah. In the presence of God in this gathered community, I acknowledge these testimonies with gratitude and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs>
eternal God, in wisdom you govern all things. And from the beginning you have chosen faithful people to serve you in ministry, calling some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip all your people for the work of ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. Now bless and sanctify by your Holy Spirit, your servant James, whom we in your name and in obedience to your will, by prayer and with the laying on of hands, ordain for the ministry of the church. Eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon James, filling him with grace and power, and make him a deacon in your church. O Lord, give to this your servant the grace and power needed to serve you in this ministry. Bless his proclamation of the word and administration of your sacraments, so that your church may be gathered for praise and strengthen for service. Make him a wise pastor, a patient teacher, and a faithful witness. Grant that in all things he may serve without reproach, that your people may be renewed, and that your name be glorified in the church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. You, James Joseph Hero, are a deacon in Christ's church. The Lord bless you and take care of you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Whenever I go to a church, I love to look in the pulpit and see what's there. Fascinating. Or on the communion table, as we have here. Eleven cents. I have no idea. I've heard a penny for your thoughts. Won't get us very far, will it? <laughs> but it's still a generous donation. <laughs> to the Sturgeon Bay Moravian Church. My word of thanks, too, for all who have participated in this day and made it what it is. The sacrifice you made. 
especially looking to your parents, Steve and Julie, and for their strong witness of faith and testimony to the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Ryan, good to have you here. Your ministry music is a blessing to, to us all. Now it says in the bulletin a word of encouragement from the bishop. Um, well, I would like you to know that you and I share a lot of things in common. I was a runner. <laughs> and you are a runner. I was a sprinter. You, a long distance runner. But each of us had the goal of crossing the finish line, being first to break the tape. Did you get to do that? A couple times, yeah. Couple, me too. <laughs> me too. This was my home church and still is. It is your home church and will always be. I was ordained in this very church and looks a little different up here now than those days, but it was somewhere right about in here, kneeling before my ordaining bishop, the late Frederick Wolf. You have knelt before your ordaining bishop for the laying out of hands. We both had our internship during seminary days at College Hill Moravian Church, just short of the Moravian <coughs> Seminary campus. And a good experience it was for both of us. But there is one more and most significant thing that you and I hold in common. We serve and we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. When I look at you, James, I see you out on the open road running with a beautiful stride and a pretty good pace, I must admit. And when I think of you and your faith journey, I think of the following passages of scripture. The first at the beginning of one's ministry, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Today you are surrounded by this great family of witnesses. People who love and care for you. People whose very desire, strong desire, is that yours will be a good and impacting ministry. And that you persevere in that ministry. But we also know that in the midst of ministry, as 1 Corinthians 9.26 says, therefore I do not run with someone like someone running aimlessly. Aimless ministry is like a sail without wind or a canoe without a paddle. And can it even be said that aimless ministry is an insult to our Lord Jesus? and lacking in respect of the God who calls you. So set your goals, do your planning, present, mid-range, and future, focused on God's will and way. And I like this one, Galatians 5, 7, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? All of us, who have been and are in ministry, laity and clergy alike, know that there will be moments we're going to be shoved out of the way, and we will stumble, and we will allow someone or something to cut in on us. Just beware of those moments. Look at the terrain. Be sensitive to what is happening around you and within you. And as we were talking about the other day, be a good listener. To determine what it is that God may be telling you and what your inner voice may be saying to you and the wisdom of others around you 
want you to hear. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners win? All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way so as you get the prize. Ah, what is, what is the prize in ordained ministry? I look around to my sisters and brothers. What is that prize? Well, commendations from the leadership in your congregation, from the district and provincial leadership, all oh, those supportive words will be there, but don't rely on it. There will be moments when affirmations may be few and far between. But remember this, there is ultimately only one prize. And that is at the end of the day, a week, a month, a year, to be able to hear those words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest prize of all, well done, good and faithful servant. And at the sunset of ministry, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 9, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I have to admit, I'm beginning to glance at the sunset years of my ministry. But you were at the sunrise. Oh, sometimes I wonder and question, but today, one thing is certain. As you have stood here and now, and now stand here, you have accepted this mantle of ministry. Your congregation in which you will be installed, the wider church family, the Moravian church, and the ecumenical church is in very, very good hands in your hands and we will pray for you continually and always my brother peace be with you okay uh, one more thing uh, we are going to share the right hand of fellowship with one another, but this most treasured book in my library is yours. Wow. Now, some of you think, well, there's McGrath, he's just getting rid of books. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a degree of truth in that. <laughs> but I have made it a practice in the years since I was consecrated a bishop to take those very special books and pass them on to others. Enjoy it, my friend. So, let us continue with our hymn uh, for the fruit of all creation. And as we stand, extend that right hand of fellowship to one another. <laughs>
Please remain standing and join in the festal doxology found in your bulletin. Unto the Lamb who was slain. And has redeemed us out of all nations of the earth. Unto the Lord who purchased our souls for himself. And unto that friend who loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. Who died for us once. That we might die in sin. Who rose for us. That we also might rise. Who ascended into heaven. Subjected the angels and powers and dominions. To him be glory at all times, in the church which waits for him, and in that which is around him, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. <laughs>
May the God of peace, who surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May our actions and words be careful and bold, so that God's love may be known when people see and hear us. Amen. Table, Grace, and that way we can go straight to the eating. <laughs>